In this video, we're going to introduce the idea of a differential equation. Uh, we'll talk exactly about what, or we'll talk about what exactly a differential equation is, uh, what techniques we can use to solve them, at least some very basic ones. There's an entire course on this that most of you will have to take. Um, and then lastly, and kind of most importantly, how we can use differential equations to model physical phenomenon, because they're a really, really strong uh, and powerful mathematical tool. So a differential equation is an equation that involves derivatives. So to be a little more precise, a differential equation uh, is an equation involving an unknown function, which usually we'll use like y, y of x, and one or more of its derivatives. Uh, so that's an equation involving an unknown function. unknown function and as I said it will often be y of x and one or more of its derivatives Um, the idea is that differential equations allow us to model change. Um, one of the big ideas from Calculus 1 is that derivatives represent rates of change. And so if there's some physical phenomenon that is, that's occurring, and we know something having to do with its rate of change, um, often we can create one of these differential equations from sort of the basic principles and understanding how things change and use it to actually model uh, what the end result of those types of changes are over, over time. Um, there's a bunch of terms that get used. Uh, and again, most of these you'll learn when you take differential equations, when or if you take differential equations. Um, but one important term that I want to mention is the order. So the order of a, dif of a differential equation, the term order, um, basically refers to the highest derivative that shows up in the equation. So the order of a differential equation is the highest derivative that shows up. Okay, so what do I mean by this? One example of a differential equation would simply be saying something like this, y prime equals y. This is a, an equation, we've got our equal sign, involving an unknown function y, and one or more of its derivatives, y prime. This one, because the highest derivative is a first derivative, we would say this is a first order differential equation. If instead I had y double prime equals y, we would say this is a second order differential equation, and so on. Uh, and if I had one that involved both, y double prime plus y prime uh, minus y or something equals zero, this is still going to be second order, even though it has both first and second derivatives, because it's only we're only referring to the highest derivative that shows up. So it's second in this case. And there are higher order. You can have third, fourth, and so on. Um, and there are, in fact, actual physical problems uh, and situations um, where it's not totally uncommon to have fourth derivatives, for example, show up. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of at least a crash course introduction of what a differential equation is, what it might look like. It's going to involve different combinations of these things. There may be other functions involved. There may be functions of x, right? The presumption is this y function here is a function of x. Um, and so there may be other functions of x that show up. We'll see examples of that um, going forward. But how do we solve these things in general? Well, again, there's an entire class dedicated to this, so I don't want to go into a ton of detail. But the most important idea is, if we're solving a differential equation, 
and a differential equation involves derivatives. And what it means to solve this is to figure out basically what y looks like. We need to find this function y. Um, just like in algebra, when you're solving an algebraic equation, you have to undo every operation. So if we have an equation that looks like this, y equals, uh, sorry, I guess I should not have it solved for y to begin with. But if I have like um, y plus ax equals b or something like this, a linear equation like this, we have to undo any operation that's done to the function that we're solving for. So in this case, what was being done to y, we were adding ax to it. How do I solve for y? By undoing this addition of ax. And by undoing the addition, that involves subtraction. We subtracted ax from both sides. So that's the idea. Algebra, or solving an equation in general, involves undoing whatever operations show up. So in this case, one of the operations that's done is over here, a derivative is being taken. And so we have to find a way to undo that derivative. So because these equations involve derivatives, solving these equations requires undoing those derivatives. And how do you undo a derivative? With integration. So integration is a key operation in solving differential equations. Um, but think about what happens when you do integration. One of the most important things that we often forget and overlook when we do integration is that when you integrate a function, it introduces a constant of integration. So integrating introduces a constant of integration. And so why do we care about this? Well, it's important because when you take the integral of a function and you get your answer, that answer isn't unique. There are a bunch of different functions that have, so for example, if I want to take d dx of some unknown function, I want to get uh, 2x out of it, there's a lot of things I could plug in here. I could plug in 2x, but I could also plug in 2x plus 1, or 2x plus 2, or 2x plus 3, or any of these. They're all non-unique. So there's a bunch of different answers when you do integration. And the same idea is going to be true when we're using integration to solve these differential equations they're going to introduce these plus C terms, these constants of integration. So that's what I'm talking about. When I say constant, constant of integration, what I mean is the plus C term that we always have to add on at the end. Um, to get a single unique answer, we need to determine the value of this C. OK. So doing so typically requires um, what we call an initial condition. And that's going to be uh, one type of thing we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on something called initial value problems. There are other types of problems. Um, there's something called a boundary value problem and things of that nature. Uh, and they all are sort of different things that allow you to give, a, they give some additional information that allows us to figure out what this value of C is. But the one that I want to focus on, uh, and the only one that we're going to take a look at here, is going to be initial value problems. So we need an extra piece of info. to find what the value of C is. And this extra piece of information is often 
called an initial condition. And the reason it's called an initial condition is a lot of the times uh, I said we're using like y of x, but oftentimes it'll actually be y of t. The independent variable will often be time um, because that will go along with what I was saying earlier. Um, when you think of a derivative as a rate of change, oftentimes we're thinking of how it changes with respect to time. So how does something change over time? And an, an initial condition will be a statement of here's what things looked like at the beginning, at time zero, before this uh, equation kicked into gear, here's what the situation looked like, and we can use that to figure out what the value of c is. So the form of an initial condition will often be y of basically some time, often zero, but x sub zero, it could be t of zero if we're talking about t, and it's equal to some value. Why not? So y evaluated at some specific value of x gives us some specific value of y. Basically, I'm giving you a single point, an x value and a, the corresponding y value, that the answer y, the function y, must pass through. These are referred to. So problems that give this type of information, they're referred to as initial value problems. initial value problems, and oftentimes you'll see that abbreviation, abbreviated IVP, initial value problem. Okay, so in this section, I don't want to focus a ton on actually solving differential equations. I mostly want to focus, we'll actually do that in the, in the next video, uh, but in this one I want to focus on just seeing, getting a feel for what a solution might look like, not by actually finding it, but by me giving you one and us kind of verifying that it works. And then also I want to talk about the different applications uh, that we can, so what types of problems can we use differential equations to gain insight on. Um, so let's start with just an example of one where we want to verify a result. Okay, so let's say that perhaps uh, I want to show that a certain answer, so I'm going to say that y equals uh, 2 thirds e to the x plus e to the negative 2x. I want to show you that this function is a solution. And notice I say a solution, not the solution, but is a solution of the differential equation that looks like this um, y prime plus 2y equals 2e to the x. So in a differential equations class, you would learn how to solve this, how to go from the uh, differential equation to the answer. In this case, I'm telling you the answer, and I just want to verify that it works on the equation. So all we need to do is plug in y and y prime. So we have our y value. Let me just copy it from above. It's 2 thirds e to the x plus e to the negative 2x. And if that's what the y value is, what is y prime? Well, we can find y prime by simply taking the derivative. So what is the derivative of this first term? That constant 2 thirds just gets carried over, and the derivative of e to the x is simply e to the x. So that first part is its own derivative. The second part, e to the negative 2x, we've got to use a uh, chain rule on this one. So essentially, we have e to the stuff. What's the derivative of e to the stuff? Well, it's e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. And the stuff is that negative 2x. And this is going to give me an extra factor of negative 2. So I've got 2 thirds e to the x. Uh, and in this case, we'll get minus 2 e to the negative 2x. That's what the derivative looks like. And now I just want to plug these two values into the original equation. So let's plug them in. We're going to substitute them in. Uh, so plugging into the equation, I'll get y prime, which we already found is 2 thirds e to the x minus 2 e to the negative 2x, right? That's what we found for y prime. And then I need to add 2y to that. So here's y prime plus 2 times y, and y is right here. 
So 2 thirds e to the x plus e to the negative 2x. And what's this supposed to be equal to? We've taken care of this part, plus 2y. That's equal to 2e to the x. So we just want to verify that this equation does indeed hold. We can simplify it and just get an identity out of this. Uh, so again, this part is our y prime. This was our y, right? We have our y, y prime plus 2y. So y prime plus 2y equals 2e to the x, which is what we have up here. So let's just verify that this is indeed the case. Uh, we'll distribute this 2 through and collect like terms. So I have 2 thirds e to the x minus 2e to the negative 2x plus multiplying these ones together, I'll get 4 thirds e to the x. Uh, distributing through to that one, I'll get plus 2e to the negative 2x, and that's supposed to be equal to 2e to the x. Uh, I will combine like terms, so those two get combined, and those two get combined, and we will get, uh, combining these first two, two-thirds, sorry, the first and third terms, I guess, two-thirds plus four-thirds of the e to the x. So two-thirds plus four-thirds is six-thirds. That's just two e to the x. And then over here, combining these two pieces, I have a negative two e to the negative two x, and I have a positive two e to the two x. So we wind up with zero of these e to the negative two x's. And what is it supposed to be equal to? Two e to the x. And then sure enough, 2e to the x does indeed equal 2e to the x. So verifying that one of these, uh, verifying that something is a solution just involves basically plugging it into the equation and showing that you do indeed get a truism. You get an identity out of the result. So there's some verification that indeed what we've got here, uh, up here, is a solution of this thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's try another one of these. We can reframe this in a little bit different way. Um, let's do this. For what values of r does y equals e to the rx um, satisfy the following equation. So I'm going to have 2y double prime plus y prime minus y equals 0. Um, and this is one thing you'll see. Uh, we're kind of going about this in a backwards way, but a lot of the times the solutions that we're going to be dealing with involve exponentials. And this is because when you look at an equation um, where we're trying to combine a bunch of terms that involve y, its derivative, in this case it's also its second derivative, and out of it wind up with a constant, or in this case zero, we need cancellation of all of these terms. And that means all these terms need to basically look the same. And what's a function that basically looks the same once you start taking derivatives of it? Exponentials, right? I'll get e to the rx times r after we take one derivative. And then uh, I'll pick up another factor of r after we take a second derivative. So that's all we need. So we know that y is equal to e to the rx. That means y prime, take the derivative of this, is going to be e to the rx times an extra factor of r. Let me just write it out that way. r e to the rx, right? This is by chain rule e to the stuff, the derivative of e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, which will pick up an extra factor of r that shows up here. And taking the derivative again, I'll wind up with r squared, e to the rx. And so these are the values we're going to plug in. And we're going to get 2 times y double prime, so 2r squared e to the rx, plus y prime r e to the r x uh, minus y, which is just e to the r x. So right, here's our y double prime, here is our y prime, and here is y. 
and that's supposed to be equal to zero. So again, all I'm doing is plugging these in here, here, and here, each where they belong. And you'll notice that they all have an e to the rx, exactly as I was just explaining. We'd expect all these terms to look the same. We can factor that out. We'll get e to the rx times the leftover coefficient. So the leftover coefficient here is going to be 2r squared. Right here, we just have an extra r, so plus r. And then over here, it's just a factor of 1, so minus 1. And that's what's supposed to be equal to 0. Uh, for this piece, we have an exponential, e to the rx, and I've got basically two things multiplied together that's got to be equal to zero. So either this part is zero or this part is zero over here. But this part is an exponential, and what you'll hopefully recall is that exponentials look like this. Right, e to the rx is going to go through this point at a height of 1, but it never gets to 0. You can go off to negative infinity here, and it'll approach 0, but it never actually gets there. This part can't be 0. This part is not equal to 0. So this must be 0. So the solution to this implies that this piece of the equation must be the part that's zero. So we just need to set that equal to zero and figure out what it is uh, using factoring. We know for this to work, for e to the rx to be a solution, we need 2r squared plus r minus 1 to be equal to zero. And we can try to factor this, uh, or we can use the quadratic formula. In this case, this one doesn't factor that nicely, so let's just try the quadratic formula on this. Uh, I'm going to do the quadratic formula, which says that r is equal to, and again, remember we've got a, b is implied as being 1, and c here. The quadratic formula is that the roots of this are going to be negative b, so negative 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 1, so 1 squared minus 4 times a, which is 2, times c, which is negative 1, whole thing over 2a. So there's the quadratic formula. Uh, if we simplify this, I'm going to get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of We've got a 1 here, this minus sign and this minus sign canceled to become positive, and we've got 8, so I've got a 1 plus 8, which is 9. And we're dividing that by 4. And so negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 9 over 4, which is negative 1 plus or minus 3 over 4. And we get that r is one of two values. Uh, if we do the addition, I'll get negative 1 plus 3 is going to be 2. So we'll get 2 fourths, which is a half. Or uh, if we do the subtraction, negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4 divided by 4 is negative 1. So there are the two possible values. Those two values of r will allow this equation to satisfy this equation, meaning this will be a solution of this equation, as long as the r value that we've got up here is either 1 half or negative 1, those two values. OK, so this is these are some examples of kind of um, how these solutions get plugged in, how you can kind of check uh, and, and think about the logic. But one of the big ideas that I want to reinforce again is a lot of the times these solutions are going to involve exponentials like this. Whenever you've got a setup of combination of y primes and double primes and y by itself, and we've got them equal to some sort of constant, or in this case, zero, often it's going to be an exponential that you're going to be dealing with. The other thing that you might get uh, occasionally are things that involve sines and cosines, because they have the same property of repeating themselves as we take derivatives. And we sometimes are able to get cancellation of the uh, appropriate terms of some sines and cosines as we take derivatives. But you will see much more about that, again, in a differential equations class. 
So now I want to move on to the actual applications or the models. So what are some different models uh, that we can create or what are some different physical phenomena that we can model using differential equations? One of the first ones that I want to look at is population growth. And there are lots of different models of population growth. What I mean by population growth is that um, we start with a set population. Maybe we're talking about a population of bacteria, or uh, maybe it's larger scale. We're talking about rabbits or even people in some environment. And we want to know how the population of these individuals grows over time. So uh, let's define a few variables. I'm going to let P be the size of the population. So P is going to be the number of individuals. So it's the thing we're trying to keep track of. Um, this is the number of individuals in the population that we're looking at. And t is going to be the independent variable that's going to be time in this case. Um, <clears throat> if we think about sort of what are often referred to as the first principles of something like this, so the words first principles are often applied to physics physics problems, uh, and in this case, population growth problems. And it says sort of the fundamental basic rule, the most basic principle that this model is going to be based off of. And in this case, one fairly reasonable uh, first principle is that the population should grow at a rate that's proportional to the current population size. So let me write that out, and then let's digest that for a minute. So the population should grow at a rate proportional to the current population size. So what this means is that um, larger populations are basically having more offspring. There's more reproduction occurring. So uh, if you're talking about you know, rabbits, if you only have two rabbits, those rabbits can only have so many kids. Whereas if you have 100 rabbits, you would expect the 100 rabbits to be having 100 times more kids. Uh, well, I guess I should say 200 rabbits should be having 100 times more kids than two rabbits. What we're saying is the rate, the birth rate in this case, how quickly the population is growing, it should be proportional to the current size of the population. A larger population will be having more babies than a smaller population, and so that growth rate will be larger. Right? More babies in the same amount of time uh, means that that rate is larger. So this is obviously kind of a big assumption, uh, and it assumes a few important things. And these are always the caveats that are important on any of these models. Um, one of the sayings I remember in, in grad school uh, hearing, and, and it certainly wasn't from one of my professors. I'm sure this was somebody famous that said this at some point back down the line. Um, but the idea is that all models are wrong, but some just happen to be useful. Um, so the idea is, I'm going to give you this model. This model isn't correct, but it's still useful in certain situations and under certain assumptions. Uh, and it's enough to give us some insight about what types of behavior we can expect to see. So in this case, the assumptions that we're making is that maybe there's no disease, maybe just no deaths, period. Um, we're just talking about something where the lifespan is so much longer than um, the time scale over which these things reproduce that we don't really need to worry about death. So this maybe assumes things like no disease in the population, um, adequate or maybe even infinite resources, right? So nobody, there's not limited by having only a finite food supply, etc. So there's all these assumptions that we, we would have to make. Um, but essentially, again, the more mating pairs you have, the more babies you expect to see being uh, being produced. So, so this makes sense 
as more mating pairs, or in the case of a bacteria, just more individual bacteria that can reproduce themselves, more mating pairs yields more babies. So that's the case if we're talking about rabbits, or again, individual, you don't need mating pairs. The more bacteria you have, if they all double uh, every 20 minutes, then if you start with one bacteria, they'll, you'll have two after 20 minutes. But if you start with 10,000 bacteria, you'll have 20,000 after those same 20 minutes. Um, so that's the idea. The population is growing more quickly when the current population is large. What does this mean? It means, thinking mathematically, that the rate of change, so a rate, we're talking about the rate of change of the population. The population is growing at a certain rate. I'm going to call that dp dt. That is the growth rate of the population. Again, back from calculus one, derivatives are rates of change. So this is the rate of change of the size of the population. And we're assuming that it's growing. So this is our growth rate of the population. And we said that it's proportional to the current size of the population. Proportional, we can use the proportionality symbol that looks kind of like the little, not very good at drawing that. No, nope, still not very good. That's as good as it's gonna get. We could use the proportion symbol, but all proportionality means is that it's equal to some constant times the current population. So this is something that is proportional, proportion to the current population. And so this is what the differential equation looks like. The rate of change is equal to some constant times the current population. That's what proportionality means, is it's not equal necessarily to the current population, but mod some constant, it's equal to it. So uh, if k equals 1, so let's just say maybe k is 1 in our case, um, then we just have, so I guess I can write this down here, if k equals 1. I'll we'll erase it from up here. Then we have dp dt equals k times p. We have, sorry, equals simply p, because I just said that k is 1, so equals p. So what I'm looking for in this case is what is a function p that is equal to its own derivative? And we just talked about that. So we want a function p that's equal to its own derivative. That's what we're looking for. What's the solution? Well, a solution is that our p is simply going to be e to the t, right? Because if p is e to the t, what's the derivative dp dt? When I take the derivative of e to the t, I get back e to the t. Uh, <clears throat> in general, if k isn't equal to 1, then we'll have uh, a more general result that looks like this. We'll have that p, which again is a function of t. I maybe should make that explicit in both of these cases. Oops. When I say p, p is a function of time. But p of t in this case would be some e to the k t. Because we can check when we take the derivative of e to the k t, uh, what do we get? We get k e to the k t. So if I take this for my p of t, we can just check what is d dt of p of t. Well, that's d dt of e to the kt, which is going to be k e to the kt. And what was the original claim? Was that dp dt was equal to k times p. dp dt 
we just solve for right here is ke to the kt, right, right here. And then k times p is going to be k times the original p, which is k times the original e to the kt. And indeed, you can see and verify they are, in fact, the same thing. So more generally, we have e to the kt when k is not equal to 1. Oh, if it's one of these other values. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, there's actually, uh, <clears throat> it's possible to come up with something that's even more general. And the idea is, comes back to that idea of a constant that we talked about before. Constants pass right through derivatives. So if our p of t is equal to some constant c times e to the kt, then its derivative, d dt of this, is going to be, we can just pull that constant outside, get d dt of e to the kt, and we wind up with simply c k e to the kt. And we can do the exact same thing that we just made a comparison of. Our goal was to make this be true, that dp dt was equal to k times p. And we can verify dp dt is right here. It's c k e to the k t. And over here, I've got k times the original value of p, which was or the original function of p, which is c e to the k t. And indeed, you get the same thing. Uh, Again, so this is even more general. This constant right here passes right through the derivatives. And this turns out to be the most general solution that we can use. And this C right here has to do with that constant of integration uh, that I was talking about before. When we solve, uh, when we undo a derivative, it's going to involve integration. And integration will introduce a constant of integration. Normally, we're used to seeing that as a plus c, and here I have it as a multiplication. Again, the details of why it takes winds up taking this form um, will, are clear once you actually take a differential equations class and see the exact technique that isn't a guess and check method. Our method here has been guess and check. But there are formal methods to come up with this as your solution, and it's very clear when you do those methods why the c winds up where it is. So again, I will save that for a differential equations class. Um, but we can verify, as we just did right here, that indeed this does work. And it's, in, in fact, the most general uh, solution that we can come up with in this particular case. So uh, note that we have two constants. But one of them, k, is typically specified. This would be specified in the original ODE. And I'm writing ODE, just to be clear, ODE stands for Ordinary Differential Equation. Um, Oftentimes, you may hear it just referred to as a DE, a differential equation. The word ordinary in this case um, has to do with the form of this thing. It's an ordinary differential equation as opposed to what's called a partial differential equation. In this case, we take ordinary derivatives, full derivatives, because we only have one independent variable. In a partial differential equation, um, it's basically scaling this up to higher dimensions, and we would have more than one independent variable in that case. And we would call that a PDE, a partial differential equation. But again, not something important, but just so you know where this, this term, I, I'm in the habit of using this term, so if I use it again, that's all I'm referring to. ODE, I'm simply referring back to this thing right here. This is the ODE that I'm talking about. That's the differential equation. Okay, or I guess more specifically, it was the one that involved k. This is the ODE. Not this one. This was this one specifically where k was 1. So this is the general ODE that I was talking about. This is the general differential equation that we just found 
the most general possible solution of uh, right here. Okay, so K was specified in the original equation, but C, C was not. It has to do with that constant of integration that I mentioned. And for different values of C, we'll get different curves. Different C's give different looking functions, different curves of our P of T. Um, so again, a minute ago, we kind of specified what uh, our differential equation might look like. So in this case, this is T and this is P because our independent variable was uh, T and P, the population depended on T, the time. So these are the variables that we're using. Um, if we have C equals one, we would get an exponential that does something like this. And it goes through a height of one right there. This is right one E to the KT, forget about whatever K is. If we had, so this is the case where C equals one. Uh, if we had K B, or sorry, if we had C B equal to two, then this whole equation would go up through this point instead at a height of two. This one here would be two E to the KT, which implies that C is equal to two. And you'd have steeper ones than that. And it's even possible to have negative ones. We could have ones that wind up going, oops, try to draw that a little more carefully, going down this way, going down this way. So this would be the case where C equals negative one. Down here, we'd have C equals negative two. Um, we could even have C equals zero. Uh, it's not very interesting if C is equal to zero then the original function p of t is just equal to zero, and we would wind up with just an, another curve that goes exactly along our t-axis here. So there is, it's possible to have a c equals zero case. It's just not very interesting. So <clears throat> we call these families of solutions. Uh, it's another term you may hear families of solutions, where basically you, by changing the value of C, you get different curves. They're all related curves. They're all some constant times e to the kt, but depending on which C value of C you pick, you wind up on a different path. Um, so incidentally, uh, just coming back to the model and thinking about what, what does this result mean in the context of this whole mess, we're looking at population growth. And what we just saw is that if the rate, uh, growth rate of the population is proportional to the current population, what we wind up with is that our population follows exponential model. We get exponential growth. And if there's nothing uh, to cap off the size of the population, right? there's infinite resources, there's no disease, no death, this population will just grow exponentially and it'll shoot through the roof. Turns out that model is not very good long term. There is no such thing as infinite resources, but it tends to be a very good model in the short term before the population gets close to kind of overusing its resources. There's other models that take into account the fact that there are finite resources. And again, that's something that you can expect to see in a differential equations class. But just know we did one population growth model. This is the model of, in our case, what turned out to be exponential growth. But there are other models, including something called uh, logistic growth that takes into account the finite nature of, of the resources that this population might be consuming. Um, but that's good enough for this. Just want to give you, you know, a little bit of familiarity with some of these different types of models. The next model I want to take a look at is the model of a spring, uh, a spring system. So this is a very physics-y model. Uh, it involves something called Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law states um, that the restoring force of a spring, and by spring I mean like a wound piece of metal, um, 
like you would see on the shock absorbers of, of your car or something like that. But Hooke's Law states uh, that the restoring force of a spring is proportional to how far that spring has been displaced. So basically, the further you stretch a spring, the harder it's wanting to pull back to the original shape. So it's much easier to deform a spring just a little bit, but as you start to stretch it more and more and more, it really doesn't want to stretch anymore. It wants to go back uh, towards the original equilibrium state. And same thing, instead of stretching with compressing. It's easy to compress a spring a little bit, but the more you compress it, the more force it requires to continue that compression. It starts to push out against your hands even harder if you're compressing it with your hands. So Hooke's Law, it just states this idea. It states that the quote-unquote restoring force of a spring is proportional to the displacement of the springs, to how far it's been stretched or compressed. So basically what I'm claiming is that the restoring force is going to be proportional, so in this case is equal to some constant times x, where x is going to be our displacement. So x is the displacement, the distance in this case that it's been stretched or compressed. k is what we're going to call the spring constant. It has to do with the actual physical properties of the spring. Um, how strong or stiff that spring is. So um, this number may be a large number if the spring is very stiff. It may be a small number if the spring is a, a weak spring that's easy to bend to begin with. And I'm going to toss in to make it totally clear that there's a negative sign here. And the idea is that the force, so the whole thing is going to be uh, negative this force is negative because the force acts in the opposite direction of the displacement. So if this x is a positive number, if we're stretching the spring, if we're pulling it to the right, the restoring force wants to pull it back to the left. If our displacement is to the left in the negative direction, then the restoring force, those, that negative and this negative will cancel and it'll be positive to the right. So it has the opposite sign of the displacement itself because it's in the opposite direction of displacement. So the presumption in this case is that k is a positive number and the negative sign is what makes the whole thing have a sign that's the opposite of whatever the displacement is. So our restoring force will have a different sign than x itself, the displacement itself, due to this minus sign that we've introduced here. Um, <clears throat> for the total force, um, which basically is going to require, so this is the restoring force of the spring, there, there must be some other force that's the thing that's displacing the spring to begin with. I'm going to call that uh, it's going to be related to our total force. So this is related to the force that's doing the displacing. Um, it's equal to maybe F, we can just call it. And we're going to use F equals MA. This is Newton's second law. Uh, basically states that force is equal to mass times an acceleration. And recognizing that acceleration uh, is related to the idea of a derivative, this is simply mass times d squared x dt squared, right? It's this acceleration is the second derivative of position, of displacement in this case, with respect to time. So if we ignore any other forces, things like um, friction, If we ignore 
all other forces. And just think of it as basically two forces in balance. There's the force of the spring, and then there's the force of us either pulling the spring apart or pushing it, uh, trying to compress it together. Then we get something that looks like this. So if those are the two forces, this is the one, and we have it in equilibrium. So this is like our force of our push or pull. So this is kind of the built-in force of the spring. This is the force that we're using to counteract that. We're pulling on it. But if we pull it and stretch it or hold it still, if it's not moving, that means that these two forces are in balance. And pull or push the spring to equilibrium. When I use this word equilibrium, all it means is nothing is moving anymore. So we've stretched the spring and we're holding it still now, or we've compressed the spring and we're holding it still now. Uh, whenever that happens, then the forces are imbalanced. Equilibrium implies that all the forces are imbalanced. They're canceling each other out. If one force was stronger than the other, that force would be making the whole thing move, right? So at the at beginning, we're pulling with a stronger force than the restoring force of the spring. And that allows us to actually pull the spring apart. We move it and stretch it out because our force is greater than the force that's pulling it back together. And then if we let go of the spring, our force, our, our total force that we're applying to it is now zero. And you'll see the spring very quickly retract itself uh, into its back to its original shape because the, uh, the force of pulling it apart is now zero. And so only the restoring force will be acting on it. They'll be out of balance and it'll pull it um, back to the original shape. So the idea is that the forces are in balance whenever it's at equilibrium. And equilibrium simply think, means basically there's no movement. We've got it totally sitting still. And that says, in this case, we have that m times dx dt squared is equal to negative kx. And we can move these to the same side of the equation. Right, so this is our, the force of us pulling on it. This is the force of the spring trying to restore itself. And we wind up getting um, d squared x dt squared. I'm going to basically move this guy over to the other side and then divide everything by m. So plus k over m x equals 0. So here is uh, what this winds up looking like. And this is the equation that we wind up being able um, to come up with. And we can try to solve this using uh, basically integration techniques. And, and we'll look at some examples again in later videos where we actually try to solve differential equations. But this is the differential equation that we wind up with for this spring. Um, so we've got our original differential equation over here. This was for the population growth model. Here's a model of a spring that uses a differential equation, right? In this case, it's a second order differential equation because it's second derivatives. And one other thing that I want to look at is cooling. So, this is literally the idea of like taking something hot out of the oven and having it cool off. And this follows something called Newton's law of cooling. It turns out Newton did a lot of stuff. So Newton's law of cooling uh, states that the rate of change in the temperature of an object is going to be proportional, and again, we're seeing this word proportional. It's a pretty good indication that we're dealing with one of these rate of change being equal to constant times the, the variable that we're interested in, uh, but that it is proportional. So the rate of change of the temperature is proportional to the difference between that temperature of that object and then whatever the 
the environment or the surroundings are. So it's proportional to the difference in the temp of the object and its surrounding environments. So again, the idea is if I pull a sheet of cookies out of the oven and set them on the countertop and the cookies are, you know, 300 degrees and it's in a 70 degree house, at the beginning, there's a big temperature difference between the cookies and my kitchen, right? It's a difference of 230 degrees, right? 300 for the for the cookies, 70 for um, the room, and the difference between 370 winds up being 230. So there's a big difference initially, and the cookies will start to cool off very quickly. But they won't cool off forever. Uh, they'll never, in fact, cool off to be cooler than the temperature of the kitchen, right? So what we would expect is see a big drop in the temperature um, of our cookies initially, but slowly they should kind of level off and eventually approach room temperature. That's the behavior we expect to see. And it turns out Newton's law of cooling captures that exact behavior. So in this case, if capital T is my temperature, so if I let T be equal to the temperature of the object, and I let um, T0 be, actually T0 is maybe, meh, fine. T0 is fine for this one. Temperature of the environment or the surroundings. And lowercase t is time. So all of our variables and or constants are t. And we're going to, again, make some assumptions. We're assuming that the environment temperature, this t0, is fixed. In reality, uh, when you bring the cookies out of the oven, mostly the room is going to cool off the cookies, but the cookies are also going to slightly heat up the room, and this temperature won't actually stay constant. But we're assuming we have such a large room, it's an infinitely large room, and the temperature of the room is never going to change. Uh, or we've got the air conditioner on, and it's set to exactly 70 degrees, and it's a constant. So the idea is this is a variable, this is a variable, this is our independent variable time, this is the dependent variable, the temperature of the object, and we have a constant, which is the temperature of the environment. And we get a differential equation that looks like this. The rate of change of temperature with respect to time is going to be proportional, so equal to some constant times the temperature difference between T and T0. Um, if we again assume that K is positive, which is often what is done, uh, then I want to think about how this would work. So if this is really hot and this is room temp, so this is our 300 degrees Fahrenheit and this is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, then when I take this difference, we wind up with a difference of 230 degrees Fahrenheit. And if K is positive, and this temperature difference is positive, it tells me the rate of change that I'm getting over here is a positive result. This is positive. It's getting multiplied by the difference over here, which is also positive. And that tells me that my rate of change of temperature is increasing. And so what we need to counteract that is a minus sign. This minus sign ensures that hot things cool off hot relative to the environment, and cool things heat up. So if I bring ice out of the freezer, uh, that they'll eventually warm up to room temperature. So it ensures that things move in the direction that we're expecting. Um, so we force this negative sign here, and that tells me that um, when the cookies are hotter than the room, this number will be positive. This number will be positive, but overall this will make it negative, and we will have a negative rate of change for our temperature. It will be cooling off. But similarly, if the object is cooler than room temperature, so if I bring ice at 0 degrees into a room that's 70 degrees, we'll have 0 minus 70. This will be negative 
and this negative sign will flip the whole thing back to positive, we'll have a positive rate of change of our temperature, and we will see an increase in the temperature over time. And lastly, because uh, we're not actually going to solve this right now, it's similar to some of the problems, it's similar to the population growth problem actually, it's quite similar. But uh, the last thing I want to mention is what happens if the temperature of the object matches the room temperature? So what happens if I put something that's exactly 70 degrees into a room that's already exactly 70 degrees? Well, then my temperature difference is now zero. The sign over here doesn't matter at all because this whole side is going to be zero, and my rate of change is zero, which means if the rate of change is zero, it means the temperature is not changing, which is exactly what we would want our model to show. If you've got something that's the same temperature as the room, it shouldn't be changing temperature. And that's what this model captures. So this is just, again, one more example of uh, one of the applications of differential equations to solve these types of problems. Now I want to take a look in the next video at how we can actually see at least one technique, one approach to solve some of these types of differential equations now that we see what they're used for.